before the colony swarms and chooses to leave their hive and seek a new location like that umbrella, the colony will actually choose to starve their queen and she will lose up to a third of her body weight to make her a better flyer. So if that shows you just how inept wow. she is. Um, so no, they wow. will, and I've seen it too in the colony, they'll even chase her around and force her to exercise oh my God. <laughs> to lose weight. It's, it, it's incredible Where's my attendees? I think I could use some of that. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Good morning here. Good afternoon yes. there. Thanks so much for making time. I know you are on a bit of a break right now. Yes. Um, it's winter here, so I tend to cycle my breaks with the bees. So Interesting. they're not working right now too much either. So <laughs> it's a good time to take a break. That is a perfect time. Um, I love, first of all, I just, I love what you're doing. I love the videos that you're putting out. Um, I love how you're bringing people to a place of actually understanding and appreciating bees, really. Um, and in such a, you know, in such a way that is so effective with kind of, you know, social media and everything else. Um, my first experience with bees, and frankly, my only was when I was a kid. And I had a chance to go. My friend's dad was a beekeeper, one of many things that he did. But uh, I had a chance to go and spend a little time with them. And um, I just remember, I don't know how old I was, maybe eight years old or something like that. Mm -hmm. But I remember um, him going and just watching him smoking the hives and then us being able to go and start harvesting the honey. And it was such a cool experience as a kid and then just to fast forward, um, I'm, I'm so happy to talk to you because there's so much I want to know more. I don't know much <laughs> about bees, but I know how essential they are mm -hmm. for life, for food security, for agriculture, for all of these things that in our day-to-day -day lives, you know, we take for granted. <laughs> it says, yeah, okay, yes. I'm just going to go to the grocery store. I'm going to pick up whatever I need that day and then go and make dinner for my family or whatever but not really thinking about all of the different uh, entities <laughs> that go into making it possible for us to have that um, convenience. Yes. So that, that to me is like the biggest impact that I see. You are the most followed beekeeper in the world. And it is incredible to see like these, these first of all, your, your videos are somewhat meditative in a way. They're so <laughs> relaxing. <laughs> I was just like, oh my gosh, this is so nice to listen to and to watch, which, you know, like I see some of your videos have like 150 million views, which is just amazing. Again, just to get people to just stop and think like, oh my gosh, like these are really amazing creatures. Yes. And so kudos to you for that. Oh I just want to, I just want to put that, put that out front, <laughs> but well, I'm so curious you. to know how, how did you... How did you get started in this? What, what sparked your interest? Sure. Well, thank you so much. And I'm so glad that you had that experience with bees. I mean, it's not very often that people get the opportunity to step inside of a hive and right. see all the incredible work that bees do every day. And so that's one of the reasons I feel so lucky to be in the position where I'm at with, you know, hundreds of millions of people seeing the work that bees and beekeepers do. Yeah. Um, it's a privilege to share it with people. You know, it's a privilege to do that work alongside the bees every day. And mm. I don't know if you experienced it or felt it at all at the age of eight or during the experience you had in, when you were going into the beehives, but it is meditative. I mean, it yeah. is, at least for me, incredibly calming and it forces you to be fully present you know when you step into the world of bees every movement you make matters and you have to think about the way you move your hands and everything mm. you do inside the hive not only for your own safety but for the safety of the bees as well so it's a privilege to do that work and um you know 
it all started with a lifelong love of bugs. Um, when I was a kid, I just loved bugs. That's what I was into. So I spent a lot of time in my backyard, you know, on nights and weekends collecting bugs and trying to keep them as pets or trying to study and observe them. That's so my cool. childhood <laughs> idols growing up were women like Dr. Jane Goodall and Diane Fossey, mm -hmm. and I wanted to be just like them, you know, but I couldn't really go to the jungles of Africa to, you know, study primates. So I'd go in my backyard and I would find bugs. They were relatively easy to find and to collect and to pick up. So it was just a lifelong love of bugs that led me to take a beekeeping class. And um, I started one hive in my backyard in central Austin and just fell in love with bees, quickly became fascinated and enamored with their world and just wanted to do more and see more. So I started my own beekeeping business um, just sort of to sustain my hobby and my passion. And, you know, that business grew as organically as it possibly could. People would just ask me for beekeeping related requests. So, you know, they would say, can you keep bees on our property? We want to have bees, but we don't necessarily want to be beekeepers ourselves. Mm. Or folks would say, can you teach a beekeeping class? Or can you do a live bee removal? So I just sort of started to say yes to everything because I wanted to learn more about bees and, and see all I could um, and also just get the experience. So um, what, what you were know, you I, doing before you or, or what were you doing maybe parallel to this shift <laughs> yes. happening? <laughs> sure. Um, I had a full-time, fast-paced office job. I was the director of communications for a few nonprofits in the wow. Austin area, and I enjoyed the job. It just was never, you know, it was a great job. It was just never my passion. And I think sure. so often in life, we sort of get this script, right? Do well in school and, you know, get a good paying office job with all the perks mm -hmm. and you'll be set for life. And for me, that just always, it felt like it was a little off, you know, I wanted to be outside and be active and, yeah. you know, working with animals. So I, I can relate, I mean, by the way. <laughs> I totally, don't, don't keep me inside for too long. I'll start to go I know. crazy. <laughs> you know, I feel so lucky that I get to spend most of my time outside and, and being active and working alongside animals. Um, you know, I always tell people, you're not going to talk to anybody happier or luckier than I am because I found what I love to do at a relatively young age, you know, it's something that I can earn a living doing, which isn't that way for everybody. Um, and it's something that's good for the world that, you know, definitely, when I leave, when I leave this world, hopefully the world and the bee population will be a little better for the work that I've done. And if the bee population is better than everyone and everything else is better and thriving. Absolutely. I think, you know, people don't understand just how important bees are. Um, yeah. It's said that they're responsible for one out of every three bites of food that we eat. Wow. And, you know, our agricultural system relies on bees so much, but it's not just us humans. There's a lot of other creatures we share this time and space with on this planet that also rely on bees for, for food. Um, so, you know, it's important that we do everything we can to to protect this species because in my opinion their importance can't be overestimated. Can you can you talk a little bit more about that about what role bees play in agriculture in that that statistic I did not know one out of every 3 bites sure. that we take and also are all bees I, I I can only imagine there are thousands of species of bees um, is it only those bees that create honey that are integral to this ecosystem that serves all living things? Or sure. I, I'm so curious about that specific role that bees play um, yes. in, all, they, in what we all consume. They play a significant role in what we all concern, but consume, but also the biodiversity of the planet. There are over 20,000 species of bees. Wow. That's more species of birds and mammals combined. Wow. Um, and what these creatures do when they go to work every day for the good of their colony and to collect food for their family, they're offering an amazing service to the planet by the way of pollination. So flowers, plants are mostly pollinated, you know, one of two ways. They can self-pollinate or they need to cross-pollinate. Self-pollinating plants can reproduce within themselves. Cross-pollinating plants need other plants to reproduce. 
However, plants have a problem when it comes to reproduction and finding a mate, and that's that they can't move. (laughs) So they need some help. Sometimes that help comes by the way of wind or even water. Oftentimes, creatures we call pollinators, and bees are by far the most powerful and efficient pollinator our planet has. But it's not just honeybees. It's, you know, this over 20,000 species of bees. They're all very important. There are some plants that solely rely on certain bees and they have a mutual relationship and they can't exist without the other. But as humans, we have come to keep honeybees because they live in these massive colonies. So they can live in colonies of 10, 50, 100, 200,000 bees. Whereas most of the other bees that we that we have, the over 20,000 species, those are what we refer to as solitary bees. So they're bees that live either by themselves or in a very small community, and they wouldn't necessarily do the big production level work that we as humans are requiring of the species. And they can't really be managed and kept in the ways that we as humans keep honeybees in these, you know, little boxes that you may have seen on roadsides or in fields or in Hawaii a bunch. It's a wonderful mecca for beekeeping. And um, (laughs) our agricultural system is built around having bees in, you know, these key places where we need them to produce some of the crops that rely on bees for production. A a great example is almonds, who Mm. almonds are completely dependent on bees for production. We wouldn't have almonds if it wasn't for bees. So, you know, every year there are tons of bee colonies shipped to these almond orchards in California and, and, you know, the work of bees is being done so that they can produce almonds for human consumption. Wow. What, what, elements of our current agriculture system, let's say here in the United States or even around the world, is posing uh, the greatest threat to the livelihood of bees? I mean, really just the way that we are handling bees as livestock isn't the way that bees were meant to live. Quite simply, they weren't meant to live on semi-trucks shipped across the country you know, going on this tour of crops, um, starting with almonds, you know, in the West, and then maybe going up through the Dakotas for alfalfa and clover, then over to the East Coast Mm. for apples or what have you. That's not the way that bees were meant to live. And what happens when we truck bees around and put these in these stressful environments, they are more susceptible to pests and diseases um, that maybe they wouldn't have been otherwise introduced to if they weren't traveling and we weren't having, you know, thousands of bee colonies in a small area. Bees by nature, that's not the way that they prefer to live. So it's causing an undue stress on the managed honeybee population. And it's important to note that when we talk about what's going on with the bees and saving the bees, you know, it is different for the different bees. The bees that are honeybees that we are keeping as humans, managing their populations for our own needs in agriculture, you know, we replace those colonies when those colonies, when there's colony loss. Um, But we're losing those colonies at devastating rates and having to replace them at alarming rates that, you know, our beekeepers are having trouble keeping up with. And then when it comes to the wild population of wild bees, the unmanaged solitary bees, those bees are at perhaps even more in danger because they're not being monitored and managed mm. and replenished and kept in the way that, you know, the the Western honeybee is. So, it's kind of twofold and there's a lot of things that we can talk about when it comes to helping bees and what folks can do if they want to help bees. But, you know, it's, it's important that we recognize that it's not just these managed populations of honeybees that we need to keep healthy. It's all healthy. It's also the wild bees as well that maybe don't get as much attention. Yeah. Well, I'm curious about, you know, whether it's the almond farms in California or, you know, other farms in the Midwest, different parts of the country, why wouldn't they, why wouldn't they keep bees there, given they they know they have their own crop cycles and, and, and whatnot? Why, why take the route of treating bees as livestock, as you say, and shipping them around? Well, what happens is, you know, those almond orchards produce a wonderful crop of pollen and nectar place for the bees to forage from for a very short window. Mm. And then they just become 
an agricultural dearth, you know, there's it's a wasteland for bees afterwards. The bees need continual blooms and more food than just one place, one orchard of mono almonds crop. can provide. Yes, the monocrops. Yeah. So they need food year round. And, you know, there's just not enough food to sustain the bees, natural food. Um, and that's one thing that people can do is they can, everybody can help to make a difference and, you know, plant flowering bushes and trees for bees and things that bees will use for food and for habitat. But, um, you know, it's the way that we're using bees um, for our to pollinate these monocultures and, you know, our mass agricultural systems. Yeah. It's just not sustainable. It's, yeah. it's just not. That, that just points to really that bigger, that bigger problem of how we treat agriculture in this country with such a short-sighted, um, almost instant gratification outcome, really just looking to well, what's the next crop or the next season rather than actually understanding what the long-term ramifications are to, you know, soil quality and just kind of the whole water quality, um, air quality, the whole ecosystem. Um, I, I had a chance to, as I was running for president, I spent a lot of time uh, with farmers actually in different parts of the country. And it was fascinating to both see the contrast between like these massive commercial farms um, that really they they just blatantly don't care they don't care about the any of the environmental impacts of their of their business and mm -hmm. you know talking to local communities their their pets can't drink out of a local stream because they'll get mm -hmm. sick and die the water contamination is horrible you can smell these farms from miles away you don't even see that there's a town there yet and you can already smell in the air and it's just and then you know of course there's you can't do much else around there in the sense of farming other than what what is built in that that little commercial system and then contrasting that with others who've recognized these problems and who are doing regenerative farming and farmers who are recognizing like, okay, yes, I need to diversify my crops for the good of, you know, having longevity and actually being able to continue as farmers and not just suck the yes. earth dry and then what? Move on when you've sucked everything out of 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 Mother Earth. And um it's it's something that is heartbreaking to see in our politics when the big farm bill goes through uh, this massive, massive piece of legislation, I think a lot of folks who aren't directly involved with it don't understand the massive implications of it, but covering everything from you know uh, subsidies to different industries and crops, uh, oftentimes the ones who have the most powerful influential lobbyists and the most money, uh, but also talking about you know nutrition in schools and how is that defined? Um, I think it was the first year that I was in Congress back in 2013. I was just shocked that there was a, I think it was an amendment that was passed to that bill that said frozen pizza in school cafeterias qualifies as meeting the fruit and vegetable nutritional uh, <laughs> needs for kids. And that this was like, this took an act of Congress to, to make sure that this was included in the bill. And it was just mind blowing to me. Like everybody I talked to and they kind of just shrugged their shoulders. They're like, yeah, well, you know, they're owned by this company or the biggest companies and they got these lobbyists and there's tomato sauce and the frozen pizza. So <laughs> what's your problem? <laughs> and, but like, I, it just, it points to, it points to kind of the bigger, the bigger uh, issue Mm -hmm. I think that that we yes like I I you know I I look forward to kind of hearing the tips and and things individual actions that we can take and and maybe in our communities that we can take and also there are some bigger policy things that we need to address that have to do with you know big money interests winning out over frankly our ability to live and thrive and survive um as people Absolutely. I mean, I, th I think it's ultimately going to take a complete cultural mind shift, you know, but I would say that the way that you feel about yeah. or felt about those large commercial farms when you saw them, 
the bees would probably echo your sentiments, you know, and they don't want to be there either. So, um, but you know, when people ask what are some things we can do for bees, one thing I always say is of course, to support your local beekeepers, but also to support Mm -hmm. the policymakers who are making these decisions. And so, you know, I'm so thankful to have the opportunity to speak with folks like you who are in positions of power, who have been policymakers, who, you know, will have the opportunity in the future to really make a difference on the policy level for bees because it's important that we protect them at that level as well as much as we can against these larger entities but um you know there are simple steps that everybody can do for bees of course planting food for bees is essential it's important that bees have enough food natural food sources to forage from and then also the wild bees it's important that they have plenty of places to live and of course collect food from but a lot of things provide habitat for bees and habitat loss is a huge problem facing bee populations across the world you know the way that humans are are making decisions for our planet is is not always the best for some of these smaller creatures that we often don't think about um but you know everybody can make simple behavioral changes you can do things like maybe not mow your lawn as much let the weeds grow weeds Mm. are a very important for first source of pollen and nectar for bees you know they're one of the first things to pop up in the spring and they're sometimes the only thing surviving in a place where nothing else is really in bloom and there's a dandelion sticking up and that can be a great and important food source for bees and other pollinators so you know one thing Erica, i think you, i think I, th- I hope you realize that there's probably a lot of dudes at home right now next time their wife asks them to mow the lawn they'll be like <laughs> no no i'm saving the bees not going to do it. I think it's great. You know, I think it's great. I I would love to see, you know, the medians and the tollways and yes. highways and I mean every place be f- a place that's Alive. more natural, more yeah. native, and it's not just bees, you know. There's so many other, of course, insects. It's said that, you know, there's I, I mean there's so many insects per acre of land and these tiny creatures often go unnoticed, but yeah. they're this incredible invisible almost network of of workers doing this fascinating work for our planet and it's it's essential to the survival of humans you know as long as as long as we are around we're going to be living alongside bees so i'm you know just so thankful to have the opportunity to show people maybe a better side of bees or to teach them something they didn't know about bees so that the next time you know they do want to go mow their lawn on a Saturday, yeah. you know, they <laughs> try to get it. I mean, that's fine. Don't, don't m- no mow if you, if you can let it go, you know? Yeah, so, yeah. um, what, what are the kinds of habitats you, you mentioned that habitat loss is one of the biggest problems where, where, and how do bees thrive? Um, is, you know, you mentioned there's, there's different seasons also that, that bees have, but as people are thinking like in their own communities, and I think this is important to mention, you know, I talked about the big policy challenges in Washington, but you know, you've had great success there in Austin with your local council members and the mayor recognizing, uh, Austin as the bee city last year, if I'm, if I'm, uh, <laughs> yes. if I'm correct. And, um, you know, and whether whether you were directly involved with making that happen, I know you went and testified, uh, but but the content that you're putting out online, I know has has uh, a huge amount of influence. In again, people just thinking about something they probably haven't thought about before, and so even as Washington policy, these problems are real. They are big. They have to be addressed and solved. But we can't underestimate the importance of. Uh, the power of our local uh, city councils and our mayors and our state government. Um, I served on the Honolulu City Council here uh, before I went to Congress. And uh, we have one of the largest city councils in the country. One one member represents about 100,000 people on this island of Oahu. Wow. And so the thing I loved most about that opportunity to serve in that way was there were nine members on the city council and that meant you could get things done. You could deliver results. You get you convince four other people to support your measure, your bill, or your change, or your initiative, and you could actually start to see real results uh, happening. So as people are thinking, listening to this, and feeling inspired, don't underestimate the power and influence that you have over your local city council member yes. to start to get those kinds because they're control zoning. 
You know, it's like, okay, well, you've got limited amount of land. How will it be zoned? Will it be agriculture, development? There's all sorts of things at the yes. local level that will have a direct impact on what you're talking about, on protecting habitats uh, for these bees and their ability to yes. thrive. So as people are thinking about this, where, where, what, what are we talking about? The ideal habitat. <laughs> sure. Well, you know, I always tell people, just like the bees, no one is too small to make a big difference. And, That's right. you know, your actions matter and it can matter for bees, you know. And the most important thing is just preserving native wild pasture lands and places for, for bees and other animals to forage, you know, as humans um, encroach more upon, you know, the natural areas of our planet and, and and develop them for our own needs. It's important to think about how we can do that more sustainably alongside these creatures. So really sometimes the best and best things you can do for bees are sometimes the easiest of not going out and mowing your lawn or, you know, right. just leaving something be. I mean, don't don't worry about the weeds, um, you know, and just if you have if you have a open area, let it let it go to the weeds and let it grow for the bees, you know, um, that's something that everybody can do. But whether you have, you know, a balcony or a yard or a garden, whenever you're making decisions about what to plant, if you can make decisions that are for the bees and choose flowering bushes and trees, that'll, that'll be something that's so important and helpful to bees, but also to beekeepers, um, you know, like myself, who we have to supplement and supplement the food of bees since they can't find enough food. And that's, you know, costly to us and isn't always the best for the bees health as well so mm. you know really just protecting these wild spaces of course encouraging people to not use pesticides and you know supporting beekeepers who are doing this work every day and working alongside bees every day and working to protect this species that you know we love so much what what do you feed bees when they can't find their own food, what do you feed them? Sure. With? So the nutrition of bees is pretty simple. They have a protein source, and that's pollen. And they have a carbohydrate source, and that's honey or nectar. So as a beekeeper, I will try to supplement both of those feeds at different times if I have to. Um, for pollen, it's just a pollen substitute. It's just a soy protein mix, you know, that's made. And then to substitute nectar, what we'll do is we'll just feed them like a sugar water. So it's about mm. eight pounds of sugar to one gallon of water. And that's, you know, is a, that's what we're doing to substitute natural nectar sources for bees. But it ultimately leads to unhealthy bee populations. You know, it's it's like mm. giving your kids junk food every day, you know. Right. So um, it's certainly not the best for bees. And it's, you know, really something easy that everybody can do to help bees is, of course, you know, just, just plant things for bees. Yeah. Um, for people who go to the health food store and they buy or take bee pollen as a supplement, or for those who go and, you know, get a big jar of, of raw honey, um, does that hurt the bees? Or, or are they you taking know, things away from the bees that the bees need? We are, I mean, we're taking their food away from them, but beekeepers have been doing it since the beginning of beekeeping time. We can certainly responsibly manage beekeeping colonies with still harvesting products of the hive. You know, personally, it's just my personal decision as a beekeeper to not sell honey. It's not where I find my joy in beekeeping. But, um, you know, it's it's just one of those things we have to do with more of an awareness. And it's mm. important for everybody to know that when they are consuming these these products, they are, you know, consuming the food of bees, basically. And each bee in her entire lifetime will only make one twelfth of a teaspoon of honey. It's such wow. a small amount. I know. Say that again. So one mm. one bee. Each bee in her entire lifetime will only make one twelfth of a teaspoon of honey. And I say her lifetime because male bees don't make any honey. They don't do much work for the hive. They have one job and that's to mate with a queen, but they don't build the hive. They don't forage for food. They don't defend the hive. They don't have a stinger. So all the honey that you've ever eaten or most the bees you've ever seen in the world, you can positively identify as a female bee because you're simply not going to see a male bee foraging from a flower. He's 
he's getting his honey back home in the hive, you know. Wow. So um, it's it's a rare opportunity for folks to see a male bee unless you've been in a beehive or, you know, very up close next to one. That is incredible. So how many female bees are in a hive? So the typical population of a honeybee colony would be about 90 to 100% female. Okay. So that actually changes throughout the year. So right now we're in the winter. Bees are not mating. The males are not essential to the colony. They're just eating through honey and they're pretty much a draw on the resources. Okay. So in the fall, the female bees will actually kick all of the male bees out of the hive and they won't let them back in and <laughs> like they'll a, either starve or freeze anymore. to death. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's it sounds so cruel, but it's what is essential for the health and wellness and continuing of the honeybee species. You know, it's right. just what they have to do to make it until spring. And it's important that when we think of a honeybee colony, we know that it's a super organism. So it's not so much these individual bees, it's mm -hmm. a it's it's a greater collective. It's the group of bees. And that's what's trying to survive until the right. next spring. Right. So what's the relationship between the 90, you said 90 to... Uh, to 100%. To 100% of female bees. What's their relationship with the queen bee? Or, or the, the, the colony's relationship with the queen bee, I should say. Thank you. Yes. So the queen is essentially the reproductive organ of the colony. She has one job and that's to lay eggs. And on at her peak, she'll lay about 2000 eggs per day. And that's her only job. So she doesn't do anything else inside the hive. And she has a group of attendant bees who take care of all of her needs. They feed her, they clean her, they make sure she has whatever she needs. And, um, wow. you know, the worker bees are the ones that are, of course, taking care of the queen, but they're the ones really running the colony. You know, we so often think of the honeybee colony of being this monarchy where the queen bee is in charge, and mm -hmm. that's not the case at all, you know. Um, sh oh. I think we're going to play, uh, I think we're going to play a little video here real quick. Okay. <laughs> Remove them. So I started scooping bees off the umbrella and putting them into a hive. When bees are in swarms like this, it means they're looking for a new place to live. They tend to be very docile since they don't have any resources to defend. They don't have a hive, food, or baby bees to protect, but they should have a queen. It's amazing how so with you every handle handful them of bees I scooped, with your hands I spent time like searching that. for the queen. I repeated this process over and over again. By the time I removed most of the bees, I still had not seen the queen, and I realized this was an unusual case of a queenless swarm. This colony would not survive without a queen, but luckily I had an extra one on me I could give them. As soon as I gave the queen to the colony, they rushed to meet her. Mm. If they didn't accept her, they would try to kill her. If they did accept her, they would release her from the box by chewing through the piece of candy that stops up one end. As soon as the bees in the hive met the new queen, they began sending signals to the other bees telling them to move off the umbrella and into the box so wow. i just waited in the swarm of bees as the colony moved into their new home after about 15 minutes most of the bees were with their colony so i checked on the queen and saw that the bees were starting to accept her i waited a while longer for the bees to get in their new hive then i loaded them into my truck and drove home i put the bees in my apiary so they could continue the important work they do in a place that's safer for them and for people and it was another great day of saving the bees that's so fascinating so so what what is it that they look for to decide whether to accept or reject a queen? So, you know, those bees needed a queen and they yeah. were very happy to have her and likely would have taken, you know, almost any queen. They recognized that they needed a new queen to survive and were so thankful. It wasn't necessarily, you know, certain things about that queen. It was just they knew that that's what the colony needed to survive. Um, so it was, you know... So lucky that I had her on hand in the spring. I'm always carrying queens around and it's just, you know, responsible beekeeping to have right. queens on hand for circumstances such as that. Um, and I'll say that Hawaii is actually one of, you know, the places that is a wonderful place that we get most of our queen bees from wow. or a lot of queen bees. And that's because of the climate mm. right now, you know, as a beekeeper, I am not doing a lot of bee work in the winter in Hawaii, it's not that way. You know, we can essentially breed bees almost year round. Um, and then also you don't have Africanized bees in Hawaii. So Africanized bees are a type of bee that are, they're 
tend to be more defensive than other types of honeybees. And that is a genetic trait that, of course, most beekeepers would prefer to have bred out of their bees. Right. So that is why it's preferred for, you know, some beekeepers to get their bees, their queens from Hawaii. Interesting. And in that in that little video that we just saw, the hive was without a queen. What What's usually the cause of that? Is it just the, the queen as lived her life and, and moved on. <laughs> you know, in a case like that, and it's hard to say, but a case like that, those bees swarmed. They were looking for a new place to live. That's why they landed on that umbrella. And that swarming activity, it's it's a dangerous, treacherous journey for the bees. You know, they're leaving mm. the safety of their hive and they're looking for another place to live. And the queen is not well suited for flying because that's not essential to her job of laying eggs. Mm. She actually will only go on one or maybe two mating flights in her entire life. And then she'll mm. come back to the hive and have enough sperm to last the rest of her life. And she'll just stay in the hive laying eggs the entire time. So she doesn't fly too much. And before the colony swarms and chooses to leave their hive and seek a new location like that umbrella, the colony will actually choose to starve their queen and she will lose up to a third of her body weight to make her a better flyer. So if that shows you just how inept wow. she is. Um, so it's likely that in that case, she just didn't survive the journey. You know, the, the colony was looking for a new place without her, but they wouldn't have made it. And, you know, those bees would have perished if, if they didn't have a new queen. That's so incredible that they, that that's a conscious strategic decision <laughs> yes. that prior to movement because as you said she's got all of her attendees around her providing her with what she needs and yes. so if they deprive her of that she doesn't really have any other options it's like a forced diet <laughs> it is no they wow. will and i've seen it too in the colony they'll even chase her around and force her to exercise oh my God. <laughs> to, to lose weight it's it, it's incredible where's my attendees see. I think I could use some of that. <laughs> um, but you know, it's what has to happen. It's it's amazing that, that they that have figured so this amazing. out. You exactly. know, um, that they have a better chance of survival for that journey if their queen is lighter and, and can lose a little weight. So um, it's they're just amazing. You know, in that video you just saw, I mean, that was in the in like a courtyard of an apartment complex, and I don't think. How I think there were a lot of folks watching who thought that it was equally as amazing or I was just insane for doing that. But <laughs> there was a family in a minivan parked out front. They, you know, a lot of folks had their blinds up and, um, you know, it was a great opportunity to show people yeah. that not all bees want to sting everybody all the time. Right. Why, why does a bing, bee sting someone? because they feel threatened, you know, if they feel like they need to defend their colony or their mm -hmm. hive, um, they can become defensive. But again, by nature, bees are not aggressive. And that's a big misunderstanding that, you know, people have been misled to believe that, you know, all bees want to sting you all the time. And that's just right. not the case. And when you're going and doing your work in and around the hive, um, talk about the smoke, because I've seen it used and I've, you know, sure. seen videos, but um, what what purpose does it serve and do you use it all the time? Sure. So I, I use it most all of the time. The, okay. the smoker will mask alarm pheromones. So bees communicate through scents, through pheromones. And if I can cover up those scent signals, it'll make it a little bit harder for the bees to know that if there's a threat in the hive or if they think, you know, there's danger coming into the hive. But what I use it for more often in my work is actually to move the bees around because, you know, if you're standing around a campfire and the smoke go goes in your direction, what do you do? You move out of the way and the bees mm. react the same way. Okay. So, you know, if I need the bees to go to a different area or off an umbrella, for instance, or into the new hive, you know, I can use my smoker to, to move the bees around, but I'll also, I'll use the pheromones, you know, I'll use the scent of the queen. That's what they want to follow. So that's why the key to any successful bee removal is finding that queen bee, because once you you have her, you can kind of control the colony and the bees want to be with her. So they will naturally follow the queen bee into whatever new hive or situation I, I hope to move them into. 
That's so amazing. And so what what will what will start to happen um, once it's it's kind of the cold season, right? That you're in right now. There's not much activity. Sure. So when things start to warm up, what, what like paint the picture of what the bees <sighs> are doing in the hive. Sure. I mean, you know, they're waiting for spring like I am, I'm sure, just getting anxious. That's, you know, when they collect most of their food. Um, they, um, they don't do it year round, of course, because like right now there isn't much in bloom. We're in the winter, you know, we're in a dearth and there's not much food for the bees. So they're surviving off the food that they stored in their hive earlier in the year, the honey uh, and pollen okay. that they collected earlier in the year. And just like the bees, you know, I can't predict the weather. I don't know when spring will come and when the flowers will start blooming or if we have a big freeze event and everything that was about to bloom just snaps back, you know, that can be detrimental for the bees. So, um, you know, when spring comes, they will go out of their hive and start collecting food for their colony with the idea of growing their colony as large as they can. So when the big nectar flow hits at the peak of spring or summer or wherever it hits where the bees are, they'll have a full force ready to go and, and go out and pollinate and collect food for their colony. That's and for me, you know, I get to do what I love more. I get to do more bee work and spend more time with the bees just because they're naturally more active and moving around and looking for new places to live. And so what, when the female bees kick the male bees out for the season, because they don't have use for them for that period yes. of time, what happens when the weather starts to shift? Do those same yes. bees come back or, or is it a new set of bees? Um, how, how does that relationship get reconnected? So, you know, the bee life tends to be very short. So the lifespan depends on the type of bee, but a female worker bee only lives about six weeks in the spring and the oh, summer wow. when she's working at her peak. She'll live a little bit longer in the winter. She'll live about six months. The male drone bees will only live max about six months until they're kicked out. And, you know, of course, in the spring, the queen will lay new male bee eggs and new female worker bee eggs. But the queen bee can live the longest of a considerable amount of time longer than the worker bees and drone bees she can live up to five years so you know she is really so important to the continuation of the colony which is why the bees tend to follow her in those removal situations so six weeks six weeks is so fast in that so time of, of peak activity um what what is what is what does one day look like during that during that period especially for them well for a worker bee it depends how old she is so bees will get an age depending on how old they are and their abilities so when a bee is first born she will likely get the job of being a housekeeper bee so she won't leave the hive until she's much later in her life and she'll stay in the hive and she'll clean the hive she'll clean the very cell that she emerged from and then she'll go around cleaning and preparing more cells after that she might become a queen attendant bee where she attends to the queen and takes care of all of her needs she'll become a construction worker bee where she builds the beehive so female worker bees have little wax glands on the undersides of their abdomen and they produce these sheets of beeswax and build it into this beautiful structure that we know as the beehive. Um, they'll be heating and cooling bees. So bees always try to keep their hive at around 95 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's so, of course, you know, the products of the hive, the honey and pollen don't spoil or ferment, but also so that the baby bees can grow and develop. That's the right temperature. So mm. it's essential that you know they keep the temperature right in the hive and the right humidity so there are bees that specifically do that there are undertaker bees that haul the dead bees out of the hive there oh are gosh. guard bees that guard the entrance of the hive against intruders and then the very last job a bee will get in her little short bee life is to be a forager bee and that's where she'll go out and she'll collect food or propolis for the colony she'll collect what the colony needs so the bees you see out in the world on flowers those are actually little female worker bees at the end of their little bee life that is, I, i'm mind blown right now <laughs> <laughs> I mean, like, you know, it's I always feel to help people I have the easiest job because just the world of bees is so fascinating. Yeah. I mean, I, all I have to do is show people what bees are doing naturally every day that they might not get to see. And it's, right. in my opinion, just captivating. It's so interesting it really how is. they have 
figured out how to do this and also in this big social collective of tens of thousands of little creatures mm -hmm. of, of which they're just one element of right yes how how do they what, what do they do to actually keep that temperature and humidity at what they need Sure. So in the winter, what they'll do is they'll cluster inside the hive. So they are just trying to stay as warm as possible right now. And they'll make like a ball of bees and they'll all cluster around the brood, the baby bees, and also the queen. And the bees will actually take turns on who's on the outside of the cluster. So everybody stays wow. warm. And they're just trying to heat their hive that way right now by st the warmth of their little bee bodies and in the mm. summer they will they'll fan the entrance of their hive and they'll kind of create like a ac system they'll place little tiny water droplets around the hive and fan with their wings and oh and gosh. make it cooler they'll also leave the hive so you know during the day up to about a third of the colony is outside foraging but at night when all of the bees come back oftentimes in the summer when it's really hot out especially where i'm at in texas i see it all the time we we call it bearding and it's just a bunch of bees on the outside of the hive at night and they're just not inside because it would of course create more warmth so they have many ways oh. of managing you know how to how to keep their hive warm and cool and whether it's five degrees Fahrenheit or 105 degrees Fahrenheit, you know, they're always working hard to keep it at around 95 degrees. <laughs> this is just incredible. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like there needs to be like an actual um, movie made about all of these different, like, like just that, just what you like the day in the life of or the lifespan of a bee and all of those different jobs and the roles that they have. It's, it is so incredible. It's, it's, I, it's impossible to hear that and not have like a really <laughs> incredible appreciation for um, just what they do. I, I couldn't agree more. And then, you know, for me to have the opportunity to actually see it every day, yeah. I mean, again, I just feel like one of the luckiest people. So do you come out to Hawaii to, to come in uh, and find some queen bees? <laughs> I wish. I've only been there once, but it is, we have you know, uh, uh, we have Hawaii to thank for uh, a, for being a wonderful mecca um, of beekeeping. And there's actually a pretty interesting history. You know, ho bees, honeybees are not native to the U.S., of course, and they're not native to Hawaii. And uh, bees were brought here by the settlers, but it wasn't until about the 1850s that bees were finally successfully introduced to Hawaii. It was um, quite a struggle to get honeybees successfully introduced to Hawaii for a long time. Um, mm. Folks in 1851 decided uh, there was a Royal Hawaiian Agricultural Society. It was their first meeting and they decided one of the most important things they could do was to form a committee to figure out how to import honeybees. So wow. they started to do this and the first year they tried, they shipped over bees from, I think it was Boston and, you know, the bees were not successful, did, didn't arrive well. They tried again the next year, they put bees on ice trying to make sure their hives went overheat in transit again it was unsuccessful but you know after years because we're talking about trying, on ships at that point and yes. so i mean just the duration of travel what to speak of the conditions would be tough absolutely and just you know i, I mean keeping bees in a new place and on ships you know i imagine it was yeah. every beekeeper's first time to put bees on a ship back then so right. um so what they did is they finally put out a public call they offered ten dollars to anybody who could successfully introduce honeybees to hawaii and in 1857 a gentleman from california was successful and brought over two hives to hawaii and they did quite well and um so that is the reason that, that we have honeybees beginning. in hawaii that's amazing. What qualities? So you mentioned Hawaii has a, a is a great source for for queen bees. What what are some of the qualities that you look for um, when you're selecting a, a queen bee? Oh my goodness! Well, you know, I I am not so much one to buy. I'm not buying as many queens as I once did, and I'm okay. really only buying them. You know, in the spring when I'm doing a lot of bee work, and I find a lot of swarms that may not have a queen mm -hmm. um but i would say for me you know 
I'm always just looking for a queen because I'm in these wild colonies and I'm sometimes in there for hours and my success is dependent on finding that queen bee. And so I'm oftentimes happy to see any living healthy queen in my, in my work. But, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, a healthy strain, a healthy queen is essential to the hive's well-being and the colony's well-being. So a colony can't survive without a healthy queen. And, um, you know, every time I'm in a removal situation and I find the queen, it's still the greatest feeling in the world each time. That's so cool. You, you were, you were talking earlier about how, uh, the loss of bees and bees, bee colonies for, for whatever reason, whether it's because of the mass, um, livestock treatment or for other reasons, how, how do you as beekeepers, um, replace those colonies? You mentioned that sometimes the loss is greater than the ability to, um, provide, uh, those replacements. I, I'm curious about how that works from from start to delivery i guess sure yeah you know one way we can do that is to buy a new queen and split an existing colony into two colonies Mm. um you know we can take one healthy colony and give it a new queen and and start a new colony that way but that's also something that bee breeders are doing and so a lot of times people are just buying entire new colonies new queens ready to go Mm. and you know it's very costly to beekeepers and that cost is of course passed down through all the ways that you know our agricultural system works and passed on to the consumers so you know this the problem of of losing bee colonies and honey bee colonies having to be replaced by beekeepers is is more than just a problem for for beekeepers you know it's it, it can be a problem for everybody yeah um you what what was your thought process when you decided to start posting things online about what you're doing Um, are are you a social media did that come from your kind of communications background or or how, how did that thought enter your mind you know i started posting on instagram years ago when i got into beekeeping just because i would go into the hives doing inspections and i would see things i didn't know and i would take a photo of it so i could look it up online or on a beekeeping forum or in a beekeeping book when I got back to a screen, you know, and out of the beehive. And I realized, wow, I have all these amazing things that I've seen and captured on film that I got to see as a beekeeper Mm -hmm. that most people maybe wouldn't get to see. So I just started to post photos of all the incredible things I got to see online. And then as I started to do more of the bee removal work, you know, that just naturally i just find that so fascinating because i get to see how bees build in a natural environment without humans making decisions for them you know i'm going Mm. into you know a a speaker or a compost spin or you know the walls of someone's home and removing bees that maybe have never been managed by humans before so that's for me what lights me up and what i love most about beekeeping and um to want to start sharing that with people you know, I think was pretty natural, especially when I started to do some of these removers, removals doing, during the height of quarantine. And I would mm. have families say, this is the most interesting thing our kids have seen in a month. And I would have, you know, the blinds drawn up and people's faces pressed to the windows watching me what I was doing. And I realized, wow, this is something that, you know, I can, I can show people something they maybe didn't know was possible and maybe something they've never seen before. And so I just started to post online and started to get really a tremendous and overwhelming response. And, um, you know, it's been, it's been mostly good for someone like me. It's taken a little bit of time to, I think, uh, get used to all the attention, but, um, you know, again, I just feel so lucky that, I'm in this position to get to show people the work that bees and beekeepers do. And I feel a huge sense of responsibility to, to the bees and to beekeepers. I just want to show real quick on the screen, some of the impact that your videos have here. Uh, 133 million, 99.6 million. Uh, It's, it's so amazing to see how many, well, I mean, you know, a lot of people having the same reaction I did. <laughs> a lot of people having the same reaction of those who um, 
uh, like you said, people who are watching you actually in person uh, do what you do. So, so you said you get a mostly positive reaction. Are you telling me there are people who like are bee haters out there? <laughs> You know, it's the internet. I think at yeah, any time true. when you're That's fair. when yeah. you're putting in that many people are seeing it, you know, yeah. you're always going to have comments. But yeah. um, no, I really feel so lucky to be able to to share the work of bees and beekeepers with people, and in a new way that you know they've probably never seen before. Um, but also to let people know if they do have a bee situation and they have bees building in a place where maybe they don't necessarily want them to be building. There are people like me who wake up every day extremely excited to to do this work and who want to help you reclaim your space and also to give the bees a better place to live. Is it common to do what you do in just using your bare hands, no suit, no mask, no nothing, and, and as you, you're helping move these bees? I would say it's more common, you know, for folks to, to wear full gear, but... Um, I'm in Texas and it's quite hot, it's hot. Here. and um, <laughs> it's just my per personal preference to, you know, wear as little gear as possible. Um, if the bees will allow it, you know, the beekeeping suit, you lose so much mobility, you lose a lot mm. of dexterity with the gloves, you lose visibility in that in the veil. And um, in the video we're watching now, I'm removing a giant hive from a backyard shed and that's in Texas in the summer. I think that was That's that massive. was maybe in September, but still it's incredibly yeah. hot. 90s inside those sheds, it's even hotter. And I was probably in there for four or five hours. Wow. Um, so it's just much more comfortable and my personal preference to wear as little gear as the bees will let me. Um, you know, I quite frankly think it would be crazy to not try to figure out a way to to get out of that suit and in those temps. So yeah, I, I agree. I can't, I can't imagine. And just, you know, as you're maneuvering in these small spaces to, um, to be able to do that, uh, and to do it freely. And it also alongside these tiny creatures. Exactly. You know? I mean, they're so delicate and everything in the beehive is incredibly delicate. That comb is made out of beeswax and I'm trying to preserve everything as carefully as possible. So, um, you know, I just try to work slowly and, you know, of course I get stung. It's part of being a beekeeper, but, uh, you just, you learn how to manage those stings. And, you know, if, if the bees, if the colony as a whole ever felt like they felt threatened by me and became defensive, I would of course certainly put on a suit or a veil. I think that's one of the things that I, I noticed too in, in when I was first watching your videos and just mesmerized, but by how you're moving with them and around them uh, was just the respect that's there and and that it must be required in order to be able to do that um, without causing causing a situation or pissing them off, <laughs> frankly. <laughs> yes. No, absolutely. Thank you. For recognizing that. I mean, in some of those videos, I'm trying to move my feet as little as possible. I mean, really every movement I'm making, I'm trying yeah. to do it with the bees in mind. And I know that if I take a step and I'm not looking, you know, I could crush a bee and I just do the best I can every day, but really try to be very mindful that it's a privilege to be in that colony and to work alongside those bees. And, you know, for my safety and for theirs, I'm just trying to keep everybody happy. So yeah. <laughs> Do you get to work much with kids in, in helping you know, expose it, them to this? Prior to the pandemic and kind of when, you know, um, a lot of attention started to come my way, I I really enjoyed going to schools. I did that mm -hmm. a lot and talking to kids and giving programs. And I'll tell you what, they always ask the best questions about I'm these. Sure. And they're some of my favorite audiences to yeah. have. Um, I haven't done that too much recently, you know, uh, things have gotten a little weird and, and different for me, but I I really hope to do that on a larger scale now. I just think if we can teach the next generation to treat bees better and yes. you know maybe not coming from that place of fear that the media instilled in prior generations with, you know, Africanized bees or sensationalizing of, of the of greater northern hornets that the media dub murder hornets, you know, if I can show the next generation a better side of bees, I think it will only help bees and yeah. and the future of people living alongside them. So don't exterminate 
bees. <laughs> Did <laughs> who, you not exterminate who, bees? <laughs> Call someone who, like me. There's there you go. I think that's that's yes. the thing is is figuring out who to call. Um, do you do you do house calls in other states? <laughs> <laughs> I do not. You know, I'm, there's uh, there's permits and regulations for each state for ah. importing and exporting bees. So, um, but you know, there are beekeepers like me all over the world who would love to help out folks who have honeybee situations and and bees living in places where they don't want them to and um you know it's it's important that people make the right decisions for their own safety but also the safety of the bees as well um you know and as soon as you notice bees it's a good time to call a beekeeper don't wait Mm. two or three or four years and as much Mm. as i love doing massive hive removals and those are the ones that just feel like christmas morning for me but you know it's really best if if you realize that once the bees have moved in and if they're they're healthy they're they're probably going to stay around for a while and you should you should figure out <laughs> something figure something to do out with sooner than later yes <laughs> yes amazing what so for i mean i feel like we could talk for hours and hours and hours on this um but for people who want to actually start to to learn more and get educated and and maybe kind of get plugged in in their local communities is there is there well how can people find you first of all and then are there um like central resources or or a site that you recommend where people can start at least sure so if if folks want to see more about what i do you can visit texasbeeworks.com or look me up on social sites but what i really recommend is is you know, beekeeping is very hyper local. So bees forage for two miles. So what's happening with bees in even my county is completely different than bees in the next county. So I'd really Mm. recommend finding someone local in your area that could be a mentor to you or finding a local beekeeping association. Folks who know what's going on with bees in your area can be a great resource for getting started. And right now, in the winter, it's a wonderful time if you've ever thought about keeping bees to do your research, buy equipment, think about if you want to get ready because the spring is the time to do so. So the spring is the time when you would buy more bee colonies, you know, and and new beekeepers can start new bee colonies. So you've got plenty of time right now to start researching and reading books. And, you know, I love reading the American Bee Journal. It's one of my favorite publications. It arrives in my mailbox every month and I am so excited and has <laughs> wonderful information about, you know, the what's up to date in the beekeeping world, not only for hobbyists and commercial beekeepers, but also the scientific world and and what's going on with our bee populations. So, you know, I would look to folks like the entomologist and the bee biologist who are really working really hard to to figure out what's going on with our bees. Incredible. Thank you so much for what you do, Erica, and thank you for the interest and inspiration that you're insp- that you're uh, helping so many other people capture in this whole other world that many of us never ever get an insight into. Just peeking behind the curtains through you and through your videos is really, really, really fascinating. And again, just most importantly, um, how critical it is to life, how critical it is to our food uh, and this entire ecosystem that we are just one part of. Thank you. Thank you for sharing this time with me. Thank you for all the ways you've served our country. And thank you for letting me talk about bees today. It's been a privilege and a pleasure. And if you're ever in Texas, you have an open invitation to suit up and come see me and the bees. I will take you up on that. (laughs) Great. (laughs) Absolutely. My sister actually lives there. Uh, we, we, really? her and her husband, they stayed with us or we shared a place in DC while I was there. And as soon as I left, they're like, we're out of here. <laughs> and so, uh, her in-laws actually live there in Austin. So they've, they've got a place there. So I will come a knock in on your door. Please do <laughs> so. Yeah. I look forward to it. Thank you so much, Tulsi. Thank this has been you. Wonderful.